very much, professors. Um, one very brief comment on the Lagergeren Award. Um, irrespective of what we may think of corruption today, in 1962 and 1950 to 1962, when the events in Lagergeren occurred, uh, corruption was not necessarily a bad thing. There were no international conventions, there was no nothing, and I think that Lagergen is a typical case where an arbitrator's personal morals substituted his, the application of the law. Anyway, but that aside, let's go and talk about Ingmar and what I like to call the law of unintended consequences. We will have the benefit of discussing both EU law, Greek law, and how English arbitrators applied the concept of mandatory uh, uh, laws and rules in an LCIA arbitration and will bring out a little bit of the contrast. What was Ingvar? Ingvar was a case where the principal was a California-based company. The agent, commercial agent, was a UK company, performance of the agent's obligations in the UK. The contract was terminated, and the English agent sued his American principal for what is called goodwill indemnity termination compensation in other jurisdictions. This is provided in a directive, Directive 86 slash 653, which, as the directive says, the parties cannot contract out of the obligation to pay goodwill indemnity. The High Court in England rejected the lawsuit on the basis that the parties had agreed to apply Californian law, and Californian law did not include a concept of compensation to agents upon termination. The agent then took the case to the Court of Appeals in England, and Court of Appeals referred the question to the European Court of Justice. The question referred was, English law does not recognize this right to compensation. The directive says, that we can't opt out from applying this type of compensation in the context of the EU, please provide your guidance. The Advocate General in that case, and this is the first application of the law of unintended consequences, stated that indeed these provisions, Article 17, 18, and 19 of the directive were use cogens separately, rules of mandatory nature, in line with Article 7.2 of Rome 1 as it was then, Article 9.2 as it is today. In other words, he relied on Article uh, 9.2. The court, however, and this is the application, did not explicitly ad endorse the Advocate General's opinion. It did not refer to Rome 1 at all in its decision to overriding uh, rules of direct effect. It did made no reference to that, but it did make a reference to European public policy. The right to a goodwill indemnity is EU public policy right. Therefore, the venue, the, the foreign law clause had to be overridden and the European law had to be applied because otherwise the English agent would not have the right, would not enjoy the right which EU law considered as a public policy right. The second application of the law of unintended consequences comes in the Mavronas case, the Greek case, where the European Court of Justice ruled that the directive on commercial agents applied only to commercial agents, but national courts, national legislators could extend the application to other forms of business intermediaries. Let's call them all distributors. This had a devastating effect. I have never come across another piece of legislation 
such as Directive 86653, which intended to unify the European market and spawn the proliferation of national rules and court decisions where one country protects agents but doesn't protect distributors, another protects agents and exclusive distributors but not other forms of distributors, another dis uh, protects such as Greece agents and distributors, whatever they may be called on certain conditions. This one directive and these two rulings, this one, these two rulings have resulted in the partitioning of the European Union to an extent that had not been anticipated, could not have been anticipated. And the third application of the law of unintended consequences was that Ingmar has already been invoked to annul not only choice of law clauses, but also arbitration clauses under the guise, under the argumentation, that the combination of arbitration, for example, in the United States, and application of the law of New York, and our friend Florian will discuss this Supreme Court decision in Austria, resulted in negation of the right, and therefore these clauses had to be annulled, set aside. With regard to Greece, I'm still happy to say that these provisions have been, this way of thinking has not been endorsed. The Greek courts to the, to today, until today at least, have exercised a degree of legal pragmatism, saying that it's better to abide by the strict agreement of the parties as to arbitration, venue, and, uh, and law. And then, uh, and that the cost of not doing so is far more than protecting the rights of a specific class. And this leads us then to, is Ingmar really good law? As discussed, there are mandatory internal laws, and there are fundamental principles of what we call, in Greece at least, and in other countries, international public order, Article 3 and Article 33 of the Greek Civil Code. Correspondently, the definition of international public order in Rome is exactly the same as in Article 33 of the Greek Civil Code. It refers to fundamental rules, which if are not applied, the social fabric of the Greek community, the Greek society, would just fall apart. And I ask you, seriously, whether commercial agents will get or will not get a compensation at the end of their termination, is this something that will make Greek society or even European society implode? I hardly believe that that is the case. I can understand consumers. We're all consumers. I can understand employee laws, certain aspects of employee laws. Most people are employees. I can even understand, of course, competition law because it's the fundamental basis of economic activity and social activity in the European Union. But the right to goodwill indemnity for a commercial agent? I doubt. Now, is it correct to apply Rome 1.9 to goodwill indemnity? First of all, Ingmar is a referral from the UK courts. Therefore, the Advocate General, in my opinion, overstepped the boundaries by ref dealing with something which the UK courts simply had not referred to. They had not talked about Rome 1. They did not talk about overriding mandatory rules. The Advocate General stepped over boundaries when he, ref when he took that position. Secondly, Rome 1 addresses courts. We have already said that. It does not address arbitration tribunals. Therefore, arbitration tribunals do not have to follow Rome 1. Indeed, and this is where I bring in my LCIA case, when the argument was brought before a tribunal under IC LCIA rules, the tribunal said, I'm sorry, Rome 1 is conflict of law provisions, and the English Arbitration Act, which was the governing act, simply says, choice of laws of a country shall be understood to refer, refer to the substantive laws, not to the conflict of laws rules, and therefore refused to apply Rome 1. And, of course, very interestingly, it said that 9.3 basically is a repetition of the rule in the well-known English case Aralis Brothers, which is that where an act required by a contract to be performed in another country becomes illegal, under that other country's law, the contractual obligation to perform that act is discharged. And that is it. 
The question of 9.3 and the scope of application of 9.3 is merely whether the performance of an obligation offends the rules, mandatory rules of the country where the performance is to be uh, made. Therefore, in other words, Article 33. Nothing more, nothing less. And I will close simply by saying that the claims for goodwill indemnity with Mavronas, for after Mavronas for distributors, I think that they cannot, of course, since IGMA refers only to commercial agents, uh, distributors cannot claim on the basis of European public policy or on the basis of mandatory rules. And it takes, of course, Mavronas takes a big oomph out of the whole argument. And with that, I think I will close. And uh, at the end of the day, consumers lose out. Goodwill indemnity is a foreseeable cost which is imputed in the costs. And therefore, we have to discuss whether commercial agents are more important than consumers. And I think that the discussion would lead inevitably to that consumers are more important than uh, commercial agents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I think.